Well, first of all, uh, thank you, uh, President Brown, very much for, uh, for not only welcoming me here, for, but for your leadership at this university. And thank you, Lorraine, for, for picking us up at the airport and for bringing us here. Um, I've been a fan of, of your university for a long time. Your university has actually been doing community engagement long before our university. And in about, 19, in about 2005, when uh, our university decided to start to, you know, to do something along these lines, we took a look at what was being done in other parts of the world. And we're from Canada, and so we don't usually like to look to the U.S. as much. <laughs> so we, we always like to go to Ireland or you know, Europe or someplace else. It makes us feel a little better. Uh, so we, uh, we, 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 we found your website and found your material. And, and as uh, your president has said, and I can certainly attest to, uh, National University of Ireland in Galway is uh, not only, uh, as we know, a national leader, but an international leader in this area. And Lorraine herself and her remarkable team uh, are individually very well known in, you know, all over the world. And uh, that's one of the reasons why she's showing up. She says she's uh, been a hero of mine. I've been a hero of hers. So that's one of the reasons why she's showing up in places like Saudi Arabia and all of these other places. Um, I wanted to say, of course, congratulations to you. I hope that that's the right. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't actually say that, but the president could say that. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, you know, I was thinking last night that um, I've been to Ireland a, a few times, but one of the first times was when I was, you know, quite young. Uh, it was in 1974, and I came to a meeting of an organization some of you will have heard of called AINTAS. It's an adult education organization. And the founder of that was a fellow called Father Liam Carey um, from Dublin Institute of Adult Education. And the president in those days was a fellow called Michael Omurchu. Uh, I don't know, Michael would still be living. He wasn't uh, too old. Uh, Father Carey, I suppose. I think I read somewhere he's, he's, he's passed. But I learned a lot about Community, one of the things I found, this was in Cork, which has its own character, as we know. Um, and I learned a lot about the importance of community and the link between the community and universities and, and learning, um, which, you know, which, which have sort of been at the back of my mind for years. Uh, and uh, this part of the world, for, partly because of this your extraordinary, courageous, and ferocious history of you know fighting against oppression, <clears throat> long before you know places like India or uh, you know the, the African nations were able to you know to fight for their own independence, uh, people have looked to to Ireland uh, because of of your commitment to social justice, and that's a commitment which. Has has carried on through the years, uh, long after the the political well the political struggles as we know continue always in in democracy. If you don't keep working for them, those spaces tend to shrink. But uh, in so many other areas, and in women's rights and human rights, and uh, Ireland has been uh, a towering. Uh, 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 leader in, in international development in terms of per capita uh, contributions to, to, to the less developed countries. Ireland is always very high. So it's, uh, it's wonderful to be able to, to be here and to, uh, to celebrate the, the happy birthday of, uh, of, of, this, of CKI. Um, I wanted to show you a little bit or tell you President Brown has actually lived and worked in Canada, and of course we've got one of where's my graduate there. There we are right there from uh, UVic, so she can tell you all about it. But for those of you who don't uh, don't know where where the, where I come from, you'll see the larger that small corner map. You'll see North, the North American map, which you'll be familiar with, and then then in the uh, far left on the Canadian map. Uh, there's an island called Vancouver Island, and on the southwest tip of Vancouver Island, you just see just down there, it's on the right-hand side of the big map, Victoria, and that is the place where, where I live and, and where I work. Um, and it's our custom 
in our part of the world to, to acknowledge uh, the, 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 the traditional territory where we work. So I always, when I, when I speak in public here uh, or at my own home, I always acknowledge that I'm a guest on the Straits and Coastal uh, Salish peoples, traditional territory. And I always acknowledge, even if it may be more difficult to, to trace, the, the ancestors of the indigenous peoples wherever I go. So I am very, very much want to, to uh, give tribute here to the ancestors, to the indigenous peoples. And I was thrilled to hear you know, uh, Irish spoken uh, at, the, uh, at the beginning. And that struggle around language, which of course was so much part of the struggle for justice, is a, is a powerful not only a powerful metal metaphor, but a powerful, um, a, a powerful uh, reminder of, 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 of justice and language and, and culture. Um, today, I'm going to, to talk about, uh, just to, to organize my remarks in, in, in the following way. I'll just say a little bit about the UNESCO chair and what what Rajesh and I are intending to do. I'll tell you a little bit about how civic engagement is structured at our university, just to give you uh, some comparative sense. I'll talk to you a little bit about uh, the, how it's positioned in Canada, again, to give you some sense of, of how Ireland and Canada are similar and different. And then, I'll, then I'm going to talk to you a bit more about uh, knowledge democracy, sort of more on the conceptual uh, theoretical side about uh, why this is an interesting uh, discourse, an emerging uh, discourse, uh, and, and what it means for, uh, for ourselves. So then impl implications of this, and then what we might uh, be uh, thinking about in terms of uh, doing together, um, you know, as, as, we, as, we, as, we, uh, as we move forward. The, um, I've, I've been often called uh, an idealist, you know, that I've been called worse than that. <laughs> but uh, among the generous, I've been called an idealist. And I, I thought I would share just uh, one piece of, of, of poet, poetry that uh, uh, when you, I, I'll tell you the year after I read it. I'll read it first and then I'll tell you the year. I'm not sure you'd be able to guess. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not Yeats. So you'll be thinking, oh, it must be Yeats. It's not, but let me read this. And this is how I feel about, uh, this is how I, I identify with this, this piece. I know what a risk one runs in being styled an idealist in these days when the sound that drowns out all voices is the noise of the marketplace. And yet, I feel that the sky and the earth and the lyrics of the dawn and the dayfall are with the poets and the idealists, and not with the market men. Anybody have a, any idea? It's, it's an early 20th century Nobel Prize winning poet from India, Rabindranath Tagore, 1916, 1916. So these kinds of ideas have obviously been, been with us for, for some time. Now, let me tell you a little bit about this chair, which, as Lorraine said, there are a number of these chairs. You've got, uh, uh, you've got one here at the, at the uh, National University of Ireland, Galway. Um, we, have, uh, we have another one at our university, and there's quite a few of these chairs, hundreds of these chairs around the world. All of the chairs have one thing in common. They all have a mandate to help build capacity in whatever field in the global south along with whatever else they do. That's, that's because that's the UNESCO uh, mandate. Um, our chair, as Lorraine has said, um, is the only chair, the only chair that, that is in the area of community-based research and social responsibility and higher education, and it's the only chair that's structured as in, uh, that's, that's a shared chair. So we don't even know how to, are we co-chairs, are we co-directors, co-holders, whatever. We're co-chairs of one chair. <laughs> uh, and we've done that obviously for the reasons which Lorraine mentioned, because we could not imagine 
a chair, a UNESCO chair, in an area like community-based research where only one person, only one side of the equation would be represented. And so it, was, it took quite a long time to persuade UNESCO that this formula, because you know they have all of these forms, templates for agreements and things, you know, big filing cabinet someplace, they pull out drawer 72 and pull out that form and now you just stamp it and you get a letter from the director general. And they didn't have a form, you know, that fit this, so they had to create one. Uh, but it's something that we, uh, we believe in, uh, in passionately. And uh, Rajesh and I, as it happens, have known each other. We've almost grown up together in, in, in many ways for 35, 35 years. Um, and we have, we have three, three kind of uh, themes that we're working on in our chair. The, the first is, is a theme around uh, um, policy advocacy and policy development. We are trying to uh, help those who, are ch who want to change and influence policies in higher education, uh, in the funding of research, um, in the, 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 the climate in, in higher education institutions themselves, uh, in uh, civil society organizations and how they see themselves vis-a-vis -vis the academy. And we're working very closely with the, uh, an organization called the Global University Network for Innovation, which is based in Barcelona, and we're working in, in that stream. Second stream of work that we're involved in is a, a global survey of structures for facilitating community-based, community-university research partnerships. There are a variety of names for these kinds of things, offices and institutes, but what is emerging over the last you know, five, 10 years have been a, a variety of structures to facilitate uh, the bringing together of people from community and university in respectful, in effective, in action-oriented partnerships. And we don't know. We know, you know, anecdotally, we know a lot of people uh, here and there, but we don't know what the distribution is. We don't know which of these models, uh, you know, is, is more effective. Which of these would we recommend, you know, to presidents or to ministries of education and so forth. So we're involved in a, a global study uh, on that. And the, the second area that we're involved in is one on Capacity building. How do we, what is going on? Where does one learn how to do community-based research? Um, in my day, well, my day, my God, you know, you could, we were lucky to have a computer. But in, in my day, there wasn't a single place, a single course in a single university anywhere in the world where you could learn anything about community-based research. Nothing. Uh, and in fact, it was, it was, it was fought you know, it took me from, I first got interested in this stuff in the early 1970s, it took me till 1989 to be able to teach a course in this stuff. So it's not that new. And it's still, uh, you don't find it all over the place. So how do, you know, young people who want to make careers over this, how do people working in community organizations who would like to, to have a role, you know, using knowledge as a, as a, as a democratic strategy and community uh, development, how do they learn how to do this? So we want to, to see where there are opportunities. Uh, are they in universities? Are, they, are there some places where community groups can learn it? Are there different patterns in different parts of the world uh, that we could learn from? Are there different ways? Could you, can you use uh, distance, distance learning methods for this kind of thing? Or does it really require face-to-face? -face? All of those kinds of questions. So that's the third area. And we welcome, we welcome the involvement of, uh, of CKI and your university here, uh, you know, in this, in, in this uh, search. We're just getting going, and uh, that's one of the reasons that I've come here, is to see what you folks are doing and to see how we can, you know, be partners together as we move forward in this work. Now, there's another poet that you probably know as well. And I didn't want you to think that I was leaving, leaving William Butler Yeats out. So um, I just, uh, as, as uh, well, on our, way from, on our way from the airport yesterday, uh, Lorraine said, well, you know, it's not far from here that Lady Gregory, her, her place was, and there's this famous tree, which I'm sure all of you have seen, this autograph tree, and we went to see that. 
I actually have a picture of the autograph tree right here in my, which I sent home last night <laughs> uh, to friends. And uh, so this is a, this is a, a powerful uh, revolutionary force in, in Irish history uh, and a, a, a great, uh, um, a, 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 a great uh, example of, of, of the power of poetry. And there's just a couple of, don't wait to strike till the iron is hot, but make it hot by striking. And of course, well-known one, education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about what we're doing, how we've got ourselves structured at our university before I go into some more philosophical uh, kind of uh, discussion. So you can see we've got sort of four quadrants here. We've got student engagement, which is where you'd find you know, service learning and those variety of things. We've got something we call KM, that's a knowledge mobilization. It's a particularly Canadian concept. This is, this is about making use, making sure that the knowledge which is generated by research in the universities uh, has applications uh, in the community. We've got a uh, process, an ongoing process, always within any institutions and universities around the policies, particularly around policies of for career advancement and uh, motivation of, of, uh, of academic staff so that they can, uh, they can choose this kind of a path and be comfortable knowing that they can also uh, advance as scholars and advance their careers in this way. And then we've got this quadrant which we call community-based research. Um, we've got four uh, spaces in our university that where we deal with these and it, it and I'll come back to how they all they all fit together as well. Uh, student engagement. We have a long. We don't have we don't have the uh, the long history of service learning at our university that you have here. We have a long history of cooperative education, which is which is a form of of experiential learning, and it's but it's it's a form where uh, people go out and work for usually uh, but three or four months. And we have the, 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 the second largest uh, number of students uh, you know, in, in Canada. There's only one university that does co-op education any more than us. It's the University of Waterloo. So we've got historically a strong commitment to experiential learning. We are in the process of moving towards uh, having opportunities for every single student to be engaged meaningfully in some kind of engagement in the community. And we have, that is run uh, uh, for us through something we call uh, the Learning and Teaching Center, which Ian is your, uh, your, your leader of that here. We have somebody called Teresa who leads that for us and we have a co cooperative education program. Um, the knowledge mobilization is done through the office of the research, uh, the vice president for research. And this is, um, they provide, um, you know, tips for researchers. They, they provide uh, seminars, uh, you know, when there's some, you know, some new research projects, uh, you know, are generating results. They'll create uh, special seminars so that that material can get out to the public. They have a, a, they have a quite sophisticated database so that people from the outside can find out what's going on in different research projects. It's, it's, it's essentially... The, what it says, it's essentially trying to increase the likelihood that the results of, of academic research will have some application to the community or even to the larger community. Um, with, with policy, this is, this is really the area of the deans and, and uh, you know, yourself, the deputy president in his former position, ours, ours is called the vice president academic or provost, um, th because this, this is an area which, uh, which is really, um, in our university, it's really controlled in the departmental uh, levels, and it's a disciplinary, it's very disciplinary. So the, at the end of the year, when you, um, you, know, you submit a report on how, what you've been doing, the publications, your teaching, the impact that you've had, and, and so forth, there's a committee uh, local in, in the department the criteria for that committee are, are set by, in those departmental uh, meetings in our university with some influence by, by the, the faculty. 
um, but not very much influenced by the, the overall university. So the, the, we can't, we don't have a, a, a way, for example, if we were to say, if, if our um, if our deputy president uh, were to say, we want all, uh, you know, all academic uh, staff to be recognized for their work and engagement in such a way, or here's how engagement, how, how excellence and engagement should be recognized, no, nobody would pay any attention and there'd be a huge revolution because it's all, that's the kind of the academic freedom and this, you know, this notion of, I, I don't know if that works the same here. Uh, but there is an ongoing uh, amongst the deans, so the way that we change that is through a, con a constant, you know, kind of subtle uh, conversation, keeping the conversation going, and this is where it's very useful to bring in examples from other places. And I'll, I'll tell you a bit more about how, where we get examples. Now, um, I, I'm going to be, I've referred a lot to community-based research, it's, it's a kind of an umbrella term. This is the way that we define it uh, at the University of Victoria. Community-based research involves research done by community groups with or without. That's important because groups do a lot of things without a university. Uh, in relation to the university, community-based research is a collaborative enterprise between academics and community members seeking to democratize knowledge creation by validating multiple sources of knowledge and promoting the use of multiple methods of discovery and dissemination. The goal of this is social action broadly defined for the purposes of achieving directly or indirectly social change and social justice. And this, is, this was when we created the Office of Community-Based Research. This was what was accepted by, by the university at the time. So I'll be coming back to, to CBR, as I call it, uh, again. Um, this fellow here looking quite pleased with himself is the, <clears throat> is the Governor General. Now, it's been a long time since you had a governor general here, and your governor generals weren't very much appreciated. <laughs> we, we actually, believe it or not, we like a, our governor general, and I'll tell you why. Because we live, as you saw on that map, we live in that very large country, but very small population, roughly 10% of the U.S. population, above in the sort of the, the loft of the, of the United States. And uh, anything we can do that differentiates ourselves from our neighbor to the south, that helps us to feel a little bit more, you know, less like those people, uh, is good. So uh, this is why, with the, with the exception of Quebec, which doesn't have much time for the Queen of England, uh, the, the rest, of, rest of Canada is not, uh, not, not uncomfortable. Um, but as you would, as you would, uh, as you would know, uh, the governor generals don't, uh, you don't have, uh, you know, a lot of uh, practical political influence. But they can set a climate. And David Johnson, I don't know whether you've ever, have you ever run into David, uh, Jim? He's the former president of uh, Waterloo, University of Waterloo in Ontario. <clears throat> and uh, David is now the, he's a former, you know, he's now the governor general. And you know what? He thinks engagement, community university engagement is just the thing. And he is making that, they, you know, they have a reign for about four or five years, whatever it is. He's making this his, you know, sort of his, his main message for his four or five years. And this has been great for us. This has really been important for us because uh, David gave, uh, last year, we, we, all of the academics in Canada come together in one great sort of a jamboree for, you get about 10,000 of them all together in one town. Uh, each year it circulates from university to university and he came in town last year and delivered a keynote address on knowledge democracy. Isn't that nice to get a, somebody like that? He should meet your president of Ireland, shouldn't he? They'd have a lot in common. So what we've got going now, we've, uh, with his encouragement, we've uh, created something in Canada called the, called the Campus Community Collaboration Initiative. It's a bit alliterative, but, and it wasn't written by a poet. But um, there, there are four, what's it, it's, it's helped us a lot because, you know, uh, when you talk about community university engagement or civic engagement, the difficulty is not knowing what to include, the difficulty is knowing what not to include. Because, you know, at a certain point, you think, well, everybody that's, you know, in the university, they live in the community, I mean, what's not engaged, you know, so are we, Anyway, so what, what, 
what uh, we've done, we've managed to, to say, well, for the purposes of our discourse, our national policy development and practice, we are dividing community engagement into four areas. Into knowledge mobilization, into community-based research, into student engagement, and into the whole business of policies. You know, policies and uh, uh, higher education policies. And we ha it happens to correspond with four national networks that we've got. So we've got a network that's f that is bringing universities together around a knowledge mobilization. It's called Research Impact. Uh, we've, got a, we've got a network around community-based research called Community-Based Research Canada, CBRC. We've got uh, the Canadian Association for Community Service Learning, which brings together uh, the, the universities around uh, student engagement. And we've got something called the Community Engaged Scholarship Partnership, which is uh, a, a group of eight universities that are doing detailed work on what's going on, the policies in all in, in eight of the universities. And that, by the way, I said, how do we influence things like uh, you know, faculty reviews and you know, career incentives and all of those things? The main way we're doing that is by, by, by surveying what's going on in all the different universities and bringing that information to our university, to our deans, to our chairs, you know, to, our, to our senior folks, and having that discussion. We can't, you know, mandate it, but we can have the discussion and as, and it is changing, it is changing, unit by unit, uh, discipline by discipline, um, the, 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 thing, the thing is changing. Um, so the, this gives you a bit of a sense of our, uh, you know, kind of the, the practical climate, you know, that we're working in, that I'm working in, um, and I want to, talk to you a little bit about knowledge democracy itself. Now, I don't know whether this is, I say attributed. Uh, Jowett, of course, is a legendary uh, master of Balliol College. Um, but this is certainly this is certainly a feeling that, uh, that many people uh, in academia have had for many years. And I dare say there are some who still feel that. There's, there are some people, uh, not interestingly enough, it's never the presidents, because the presidents are always interacting with community, with government, internationally. Never people like Lorraine and her team, because they're defined as people you know, in between the community and the university. But for a lot of our, my, you know, co my colleagues, they, they, they really do feel that, the, that they have a monopoly on, you know, the, they, they have the, the imprint on what counts as official knowledge. And for very good reasons, some of which were acknowledged by your president, universities have been given the, the, by society, uh, a, particular, um, uh, a particular mandate to work on, to manage knowledge, manage knowledge on behalf of society. This isn't knowledge democracy. <laughs> so there's a, there's, a, there's a growing discourse that talks about knowledge democracy, and here's a couple of, of couple of people. So there is a radical departure in the politics of knowledge that we must recognize. Voice, protest, resistance, participation, and rights do not exist, exhaust the framework of democracy. For, for that, one needs also a democracy of knowledge. Um, the struggle for global social justice will therefore be a struggle for global cognitive justice. Uh, Boaventura uh, de, de Santos Sosa, a sociologist from, from uh, Portugal, and uh, Shiv uh, Visvanathan, a, um, really an environmentalist and philosopher from, from India. And then, of course, this, this notion of beyond the spectator view of science. So, what, I think one way to try and understand you know, where this knowledge democracy discourse is coming from is to contrast it to uh, two other knowledge discourses. One is knowledge economy, 
which we've been using in, in higher education and in, in the policy areas for 30, 35 years. Uh, another is knowledge society, which has got some knowledge economy, which can be traced back to Hayek, a, a Chicago economist, um, has, has been an important discourse. It's a discourse, however, that has, has for a variety of reasons, ended up uh, much more linked to, to uh, uh, jobs and skills development and a way of harnessing um, you know, uh, people to, you know, to, 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 to the market. And that's great when the market is working tickety-boo. And the market starts to slip and slide, and uh, you know, as it has done in the last few years, then you, you suddenly wish, oh, I wish there were something other than the market that the knowledge economy were relating me to. Other people, you know, political scientists and uh, sociologists have, have said, well, that's too narrow, knowledge economy, it's not that. We, we need something that links knowledge more to uh, political participation, to citizenship, to engagement, to inclusiveness. And so this, this concept of knowledge uh, society is, you know, one that I think that many of us feel much more comfortable with and we feel it much more represents and it's a it's a it's a good solid uh, discourse but the, the limitation of both the knowledge economy and the knowledge uh, society discourses are making one you know for the most part are making an assumption that the body of knowledge the body of knowledge that you are link they're using to develop skills or the body of knowledge that you want you know, to, to become more engaged is more or less the, 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 the canon, the Western canon that has been in existence for not the whole that long, but say 500, 550 years. A Eurocentric, male, white, you know, kind of, kind of, kind of knowledge base, which has served us, I must say, extraordinarily well in many, many, many ways. But it is, does not represent you know, as we are, you know, beginning to experience not only economic globalization, but globalization of cultures and everything else, um, it, it, isn't, it doesn't represent the full, uh, you know, the, the full experience of what it is to be human, and certainly not the full experience of what it is to be human in, in a global basis. So knowledge democracy, then, there comes, there are three, it means three things. First of all, it means a recognition of multiple epistemologies. So, for example, in my part of the world, I started out by acknowledging that I, I live and work on the traditional territory of the Coast Salish peoples. And uh, there is there, there, the, the knowledge of indigenous peoples in Canada and other parts of the world, uh, you know, goes back, uh, you know, tens of thousands of years. And is a different, and has a different uh, kind of uh, epistemological base. It's it's a more holistic uh, base. It's a more spiritual uh, epistemological base. And we are learning, you know, in in uh, in our part of Canada, we are learning that in in a, in so many areas, environmental work, or in teaching work, or in uh, social work, or in uh, you know, in, uh, in, uh, in participatory de de democracy, there's, there's a lot more there on that indigenous, uh, you know, knowledge side than we'd ever thought. And so there's a, there's a huge uh, effort underway now to revitalize and recover some of those kinds of traditions. But there are other, there are other epistemologies. There are epistemologies of, if you are differently abled, if you are differently abled and you live in the world where, you know, other, other people are, you know, in, abled in different ways than you are, if you are, if you don't have sight, if you don't have hearing, if you are quadriplegic, if you have a different, you know, kind of, if your mind is made up in a different way, you see the world, you experience the world in a very different way than, than people who aren't, you know, differently abled. There is an epistemological basis to that. There is a knowledge. There are insights that can be derived from the fact that one is living and seeing 
and experiencing the world in a different way that, frankly, we, we miss. We miss, you know, in, in the kind of straight up, um, uh, you know, way that we understand stand knowledge. And so there are, there are, there's an infinite number of ways to experience the world. It's a, it's, it's a uh, you know, the, the, the knowledge world, the world of knowledge is as diverse as, as, the, as the biological world. And as we know, that, you know, the hundreds of millions of forms of life, there are hundreds of millions of forms of, of, of understanding life and understanding relationships. And the, this, this, the people like uh, the Zvanathan or, or, or uh, Boaventura de Santos Sosa um, and others uh, are, are saying that we, we need to open ourselves up to, to, to extend, to take a deep breath and breathe in and, and, and to find ways to bridge you know, the, the abyss between some knowledges which are, seem to be acceptable and some aren't. So that's one thing to, to think about, is the recognizing multiple epistemologies. Um, a second thing is that there are, and this is Darlene, my, my wife is, is doing a workshop right now, right as we speak. We should probably have gone all of us over there, would have learned a lot more, been more fun. Um, <laughs> uh, that there are different ways that knowledge is expressed in a lot of different ways. It's not just expressed on text. It's not just expressed in a, in a, in a, in a Twitter feed. It's not just expressed in, you know, in, in some charts. It's also expressed you know, in music and in, in drama. In, in theater, in sculpture, you know, in, 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 in all kinds of things. So this is saying that you, we can use all of these different ways of constructing knowledge. Those are actually research, you can add, those are research methods. The arts are not just a way of, you know, cheering ourselves up. Uh, they are, or reflecting back our reality. They are also ways of creating and co-creating knowledge. So this, this second one is, is all about that. A third thing is to think about knowledge uh, and to use knowledge uh, as a tool. You know, we talk about, we do, I, I'm a professor of community development. Th there are a lot of different strategies for community development, political strategies, economic strategies, cultural strategies. But knowledge strategies are also very useful, and we should think about that. You know, for example, um, um, on our island, on Vancouver Island, we have about uh, oh, 15 or 16 food action groups. Um, and we have a couple of, of uh, very important professors of food security and those kinds of things. So we have gotten those people together. And they together um, have, have, have done surveys of you know, what's needed in terms of local food production and distribution. And, and they have used that to organize themselves in order to get changes made at local municipal level uh, in, you know, in, in regulations, for example, where, uh, where you can organize a farmer's market or not. Uh, or uh, you know, at the provincial level, things like um, you know, the, what, what, where, you can have a, uh, where you can have an egg inspection plant. You saw that island up there, remember, when I first came? Now, believe it or not, up until two years ago, Every egg that was laid by every chicken on that island, if you wanted to sell it, it had to be put on a ferry, sent over to the lower mainland, that's called Vancouver, and then come back then the next day. Uh, it was inspected over there and then come back and be sold. Why? Because we didn't have an egg uh, inspection facility on our island. And there's a lot of things in that. So, so there are ways in which knowledge, but so you could just jump up and down and say, well, we want this, we want this, but it's much more effective if you've got data. If you've got data showing what's happening in every single, in all the farms and all the communities up and down. So this is what I mean by thinking about using knowledge as a strategy for organizing, you know, for change. So what does this mean for ourselves um, in, uh, in universities? Well, um, it means, it, to, some degree, to some extent, this is, this is a, a change in the, in the knowledge culture. We are, we're calling for a change. We're not calling for a change in the knowledge culture for everybody. You know, I mean, some people get nervous. Oh, my God, you mean, you know, fundamental science is out the window? Not at all. We have to have that. We must support that. But what we're saying is that for those people that are in fields, that where they are engaged, whether it's in, in professions 
or in disciplines that are engaged with people, then we need to think about uh, our work in terms of, of the co-construction of knowledge. And that means working with community partners. It also means, as you've been learning here uh, at, at your university, it also means learning to listen. That's, I think, the hardest thing that uh, any of us as academics. We, as academics, we did well in school. You know, if we didn't, you know, we, we the, and the older we got, you know, the more confidence that we, we, we obtained around what we knew. And we, we started to believe that, you know, in fact, well, I guess I'm an expert. I guess I'm an expert, you know, in whatever the, the field of it is. Because I'm in the university, my, my, my grandmother called me an expert. My, my neighbor's kid called me an expert. Maybe I'm an expert. But we can't be. We can't be. N none of us, no matter what, how, how good a sociologist we are, studying uh, you know, uh, uh, housing affordability, none of us know as much about uh, what, what homelessness is as somebody who has to look for every night you know, uh, another place, another shelter. They can only stay three days there. You can only stay in that one if you don't drink. You know, you know what the rules are. And that's the same thing that the daily lived experiences of people who, don't, who are not, you know, uh, the ones, not the CEOs and the banks, are, are difficult and survival and resistance and the, the knowledge that exists among people who are trying to survive, let alone trying to change, is, is remarkable and learning to listen to that. We also need to let communities set our research agendas. Now again, I'm not saying this is for all research, but for those of us who are so disposed, we should have, um, we should be able to, you know, have careers and we should be able to advance uh, situations in our communities, you know, along these lines. Um, we need to recognize that, that knowledge is used differently in the community. In a community organization, what you're looking for is you're looking for solutions. You may be looking for some knowledge which will give you, help you with your, your research grant or your evaluation, or you may need to know there's three different ways that I could deal with, uh, um, you know, with injection drug abuse uh, in, in my community. Which is the best one? I better do a, get somebody to do the literature review and figure it all out. Um, we do, we, so we need to, to in the university, knowledge, it's, we, we don't necess it doesn't necessarily, we can have a perfectly legitimate career without ever actually having very much impact on the community at all. In fact, some people would advise, it used to be in my university, that people would say to young people, don't you bother with any of that community stuff, it'll set your career back for you know, 20 years. Um, but we do need, in negotiating the relationship with the community, we need to come to an understanding the community needs to know about our knowledge culture. We do need to publish things. And there's nothing wrong with publishing things. But the community needs to understand what role that plays in our life. We need to understand what does that organization need uh, you know, from us and can we, can we deliver it. Um, we, of course, we need to build capacities uh, amongst ourselves for our students. We need, I've already spoken about adjusting the incentive systems and we need to just as you have created you know CKI people were doing you know engagement before CKI was invented we've been doing it ever since there have been universities but once you created CKI you increased the you know the pace of change and you de you developed uh, methods and approaches you knew what you needed what the partners needed to understand about the students what the students needed to understand, how to provide a, a, a way for the students to reflect on those experiences, to make them into something pr profound and deep, and not just a kind of, you know, tourism in the, uh, you know, out of the class kind of tourism. Um, this, I'm not, I'm going to skip that one. The, um, so moving forward, well, as your president has said, and has, as Lorraine, who is a, a very active member of this global movement, uh, d demonstrates every day with her work, we are part, this knowledge democracy, this engaged scholarship, is a global movement. It is a legitimate, visible trend in higher education. 
It's not, as all of us know, it's not the only trend. And universities, particularly universities that are public universities, are spaces of contestation. And there are many interests in society that would like to see the university a little bit more closely aligned with their interests. The market has been there for years, will always be with us. This, however, this revindication of the kind of the right, this renegotiating of the contract between society and the university is real. It's growing. Uh, all these global networks that, uh, that, that, uh, that, we've, that, that we've been mentioning, and which, which your university is part of, are evidence that there's, there's something happened. Will there be other trends in the future? No doubt. But for right now, this is one that we, that, that we like. You are certainly well placed. You are part of that. And I look forward to more, more of that work. We, we need to continue to, to, I would say, uh, on this area of the, particularly on the community university research side, need to continue to build the structures and the, and the capacities in both the community and university side to advance that, that thing, that uh, knowledge democracy. One of the things that we need to do, all of us, is we need to think about how can we, how can we support the, the, the strengthening of capacity in the global south. The irony is that for people like myself and Rajesh, I got my start in Tanzania, and it was in Tanzania through the, the ideas of Julius Nyerere, who said poor people don't use money for a weapon, they use knowledge and they use leadership. And Rajesh's, you know, the influence, the early Gandhian influence in India, uh, about knowledge serving, serving the people. That energy, Paulo Freire, I don't know if anybody remembers Paulo Freire, Brazilian, um, who you know, uh, said the, you know, we have to learn to, you know, to, to write the world as well as to read the world. Um, th so much of this inspiration came from the global south. But in the last 10 years, the institutionalization of this stuff is coming in the global north. So uh, many of the networks are, are in the north. So what can we do? What can we do to increase the speed of development of these networks in the global south? Um, one, of the, one of the key challenges is how do we build capacity in civil society itself? Because it's one thing to be, for us at the university, I'm paid. I'm paid, even if I go into the university, I'm paid to do community engagement work. Um, uh, all, all my students are, you know, paying or you know, partially subsidized to to be in the in the community be, as part of their curriculum. But if you're working in a community organization these days, you know, with the difficulty, the setbacks, and one thing and another, uh, times are tough, and you may not have very much capacity. Who's going to sit with? Uh, who's going to go to? Oh, Lorraine's coming. Oh my God, who's going to have to meet with Lorraine today? You know. That's, I have it all the time. We don't have enough capacity, and we don't have this specialized kind of um, you know, knowledge, uh, democratic knowledge research capacity in, in our community organizations. We need to build that. Um, we obviously need to, uh, to focus on to influence policies. And I, I'm, I'm saying that I've just added this part about inequality because, my goodness me, the... <laughs> Uh, you know, we've had a, a great, you know, we've had a lot of reflections the last couple of days because of the passing of one of the, 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 the women who was particularly, who started us on this inequality game over there. Her name shall remain nameless, but you'll, you know who I mean. Um, the last 30 years has seen, it. we are really being undermined as citizens. You know, when, when the, 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 the wealth, so much of the wealth has shifted in our countries, both in the world and in our countries, from, you know, middle class and from the poor to the very rich. And that is not, simply not sustainable. So I, I think that, and no wonder, you know, the civil you know, community sector is having a hard time. We're, we're expressing, experiencing a hard time in, in universities, public institutions. You know, middle class people are really struggling, you know, to, to hang on to whatever that means. So I, I really do hope that, you know, in terms of the kind of the social, the social change orientation, the social justice orientation of all of this, that, that we keep in mind the great research that's being done now uh, and led by so many people. Um, one space which 
um, is, if you don't know about this organization, Guni, it's called, um, it's a really a good one, interesting one. And this is the conference that they're organizing. Oh, too far. To ran ahead of myself. Can't say thank you yet. <laughs> uh, is uh, in May. And what, is, what they're trying to do is bring together networks, all these various networks, Talwar and Geyser and Pascal and all these different networks all together in one space. Because interestingly enough, Spain is really, really up against it. You know, the university that we work with in Spain had to close down for almost two weeks unpaid vacation in order to make the, the you know, make the, uh, keep, the, keep the, 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 th the institution open. So all of them have had cuts of 25%. So they are motivated <laughs> to talk about transformation. And so they give us a space that may be not quite so bad here. Uh, it's not quite so bad in Canada. Could get that way. So uh, that's something to, that's a, a wonderful space. So um, somebody mentioned that as I was, a, I'm a poet. Um, I've got one kind of, one form of poetry that I'd like to close with, and that's, that's, it's a, it's, it's a, uh, it's, I'm sure this is familiar to, uh, this is a form, it's, it's a, a street chant, and it, it comes out of the, uh, in our part of the world, it comes mostly out of the peace movements, you know, whenever you have big, long, you know, demonstrations, big, long parades of people, yeah, it's boring, you know, you're walking along, your feet hurt, and, you know, there's somebody will, you know, will get some kind of a chant going and, you know, you get involved in call and response and, and pretty soon you forget how tired your feet are and you start, yes, we're, you know, we're marching for a good cause. So this is, I've done, I've created one for the 10th anniversary of uh, Community Knowledge Initiative. And the way it works is as follows. I will, I'm going to say, I say and then you say. So... And then, so I, uh, I'll say, we'll, we'll, we'll try it out here. I say social, you say change. Social, change. social. Change. I say we want, you say a fair world. We want, fair world. we want, fair world. I say engaged, you say universities. Engaged, universities. engaged. Universities. I say peoples, you say knowledge. Peoples, knowledge. peoples. Knowledge. I say let's build, you say community. Let's build. Community. Let's build. Community. I say inclusive, you say societies. Inclusive. Society. Inclusive. Society. I say knowledge, you say democracy. Knowledge. Democracy. Knowledge. Democracy. I say Galway, you say rocks. Galway. <laughs> Galway. <laughs> I say Ireland, you say rules. Ireland. Rules. Ireland. Rules. I say thank you, you say CKI. Thank you. CKI. Thank you. CKI. Thank you, NUI Galway. Thank you. Thank you. I say happy. You say anniversary. Happy. Anniversary. Happy. Anniversary. I say that's. You say all. That's. All. That's. All. <laughs> Thank you very much.